morning and welcome to Unstoppable. I'm Sajel Govindrao. And I'm Ashley Robinson. Coming up on today's show, Mark and Zach take us through the NBA, Sarah and Tia break down everything Formula One, and Sarah and Ryan give their analysis of the NHL so far. And of course, Rami and Issa have the last top 10 plays of the semester. Also, stay tuned for my sit down with basketball player Garrett Johnson, who just stepped back on the court for the first time in two and a half years after undergoing chemotherapy. But first, it's time for the rundown. Women's indoor track set four new school records and 12 personal busts on December 2nd at the Yuri Spence Garcia meet in Staten Island. Grad student Rachel Horowitz records in the 60 meter dash and the 300 meter dash and sophomore Alexia Masood set a record in the 500 meter dash. Freshman Cameron Holness set a record in the 200 meter dash in her first outing in a buff and blue jersey. The team will next compete on January 20th in the Cardinal Classic at Catholic University. Men's basketball has continued their early success and currently sits atop the A-10 standings with a 7-2 record. Their two losses came in the last two weeks against the University of Illinois Chicago and South Carolina. The team got back on track in their most recent game on December 5th, narrowly defeating Navy 79-77 at home in overtime. GW also continues to dominate when it comes to A-10 weekly honors. Four of the six awards given out so far this season have been to revolutionary players, including Player of the Week James Bishop and Rookie of the Week Darren Buchanan last week. GW women's basketball has hit a bit of a rough patch recently after starting 3-0. Their record now stands at 4-5. But that didn't stop them from putting on a stunning display on November 30th when they defeated when the team defeated Cheney by 61 points. And the team is also 3-0 in home games this season. The team narrowly lost to Towson a week later, despite sophomore Nia Robertson putting up a career high 30 points. The final score was 68 to 60, and the team takes on Coppin State next. Swim and Dive had a memorable meet at Princeton's Big Al Invitational, which wrapped up on December 3rd. The men's team finished sixth overall with, with redshirt senior George Mad Maddock breaking his school record in the 100-yard freestyle twice on the final day of competition. The women took home a third-place overall finish. Sophomore Phoebe Wright broke her own school record in the 200-yard backstroke, also winning the event. Junior Dara Rayblatt earned a school record in the platform dive. To round out the meet, junior Ava DeAngelis set a school record in the 100-yard breaststroke, and junior Barbara Shaw set a school record in the 100-yard breaststroke. That's it for the rundown. Next up, Mark and Zach break down the NBA. Welcome back to the Frontline Hardcore Edition. I'm Mark Ashkar, joined by depressed Knicks fan Zach Brody. As we're in the thick of things in the NBA, a common theme that's been going on is the rise of the young guys. Seems like the veterans we all know in the NBA have kind of taken a step back in terms of team success, don't you think, Zach? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point because you never think you're going to reach that point where you know, the old veteran guys that you've been growing up watching are kind of near the end of their careers yeah, and the young guys sure. are really taking over. Yeah, right. But we're at that point right now. And I think a really good place to start is the Magic because the Magic are this team that they just weren't good a few years ago and now they're top of the East. Yeah, like you're coming out of nowhere, really. And, and for me, it all starts at the defensive level because this team, first of all, has the sixth best defensive rating in the entire NBA. They've got nine steals per game, and they're not even fully healthy right now. I mean, they got two of their kind of role players, or, or even better than role players, who are just about to come back from injury in Wendell Carter Jr. and Markel Fultz. And still, they're number two in the East. So, I mean, w w what are you going to say? Yeah, I mean, for sure. On paper, they don't really have that big superstar, but they have that lethal, like, young two-player combo in Franz Wagner and Paulo Bancaro. Paulo just dropped 40 the other night in his career high. They're both averaging around 20 points per game on good efficiency, over 45%. And I think a key component that doesn't really get brought up in terms of these like teams is team chemistry. I feel like the Magic really have that set point and the players, they all know their roles on the team. Yeah. I think a prime example in that is Cole Anthony, who comes off the bench. I feel right. like he could start on a lot of teams. And he just has, he's had a really good campaign so far. 15 points per game off the bench. Leads the third best second unit in basketball. And um, in my opinion, I think he's a front runner for sixth man of the year. What are, th what are your thoughts about that? I mean, 
I'm, I'm not here to disrespect Cole Anthony. I think he's a good player. But at the same time, if you're going to bring up the sixth man of the year, I'm taking a guy who's got 15 four points a game. His name starts with I, and uh, I guess his second last name starts with Q. But his name is Emmanuel Quickly, and holy, this man is on fire. I mean, let's just talk about him right here. He, first of all, plus 450 to win sixth man of the year. I'm taking those odds all day long because when he's hot, he can score the basketball like nobody's business. I mean, he brings these quick bursts of energy off the bench and can really replace or cover anyone in that lineup. And that's why he's so valuable. And honestly, that's why I like him coming off the bench. The only worry with him is his contract right now because he's only getting around two or three million a year. He obviously wants more, and I'm not sure how high the Knicks are willing to go. So a little bit of a controversy in there. But other than that, if he does stay on the Knicks, I mean, the stats speak for himself. And just watch him play once. Like, this dude's a lock. I mean, lock it in. Emmanuel quickly, sixth man of the year, safest thing you're going to get. Seems like IQ can't help the Knicks beat the Celtics this year. 0-2 oh, soon to be 0-3 oh, after. Guess we'll see tonight. tonight. Buddy, cocky. We'll see. So, I mean, staying with the young theme, a team I want to talk touch about is the Oklahoma City Thunder. And they're led by MVP candidate Shea Gillis Alexander, and currently second in the West. Shea gives you a light 30 per night. Not only does the man look fly, he plays fly as well while, at, while leading the league in steals. And... In my opinion, I think the Thunder have the best depth in the NBA. They can go 10-man deep on any given night. They have that young energy, that burst. And how can I forget about Chet Holmgren, the unicorn? Yeah. My brother is seven foot one, can handle, shoot the basketball while having a sweet touch around the rim. What are your thoughts <laughs> about the team and Chet overall? My brother's seven foot one. <laughs> I mean, when you talk about Chet, you think rookie of the year. And, and rookie of the year, I think you got to take a step back and talk about Wemby because Wemby's this guy that everyone saw as the clear-cut rookie of the year coming in. I mean, so much hype around frame, him. Seven-foot five frame. I mean, so much hype around him coming into the league. But here's the thing. See, on the stat side of the ball, he's averaging 20 and 10. You know, he's he's there. He's where you need to be to think of, oh, yeah, he might be the rookie of the year. But when you look at the team's success and how the Spurs are actually doing, and I love Greg Popovich, but they've got less than five wins this year. I mean, the team chemistry just isn't there. They're not winning games. And so your you know, potential rookie of the year isn't helping your team win. So you have this conflict between, do I want my rookie of the year candidate just to be someone with the best statistics, or do I want them to be the person that's helping their team. You know, maybe they're not as good statistics-wise, but they're helping their team be second in the East. And I'm not sure where, you know, where offensive or, or rookie of the year lies on that continuum. Yeah, I mean, taking all points into factor, I think it's clear this season that Chet Holmgren is the rookie of the year. And I'm going to go show you why real quick. So as you can see here, he's averaging close to Wemby stats, good 17 points per game, eight rebounds. But where the key difference is, is the fact that he's the team's success. He's helped the Thunder propel themselves into the second seed in the West, while the Spurs are dead last, I think, at four or five wins. And where he differs from Wemby as well is the efficiency. He's shooting a good 52% from the field, which is just elite in today's basketball as a rookie and still has much to improve. 38 from three was 50, 40, 90 for most of the season. And not to mention, he could do it at both ends of the floor. 2.4 blocks, which is fifth in the NBA. And at minus 65, I think you should hammer Chet Holmgren as Rookie of the Year. Should we hammer it? should hammer it. <laughs> that is going to do it for us today. Thank you guys so much for watching with us all season. For Mark and myself, been we'll a lot of fun. Semester. We will catch you next semester. Thanks, Mark and Zach. Now we go to Sarah and Tia, who have all the latest on Formula One. Welcome back to Unstoppable's F1 coverage. Now that the season has ended, we're going to give you an inside look at the last two races and then our thoughts and predictions for the upcoming 2024 season. I'm Tia. And I'm Sarah. First, we're going to kick it off to Las Vegas, which was a very interesting race week in general. The week leading up to the race, it was just expected to be a star-studded event, just a show, and no one was really thinking about the racing, and it got a lot of criticism because of it from fans and drivers alike. Like, we had Max Verstappen saying, after some of the practices that he's not excited, doesn't like driving it, but then when he won, he was singing Viva Las Vegas in his car. It's very interesting. 
But the main thing that was focused before the race was the FP1 incident with Carlos Sainz. So basically what had happened there was a manhole cover wasn't properly welded down, and the downforces on the car are so great that the negative pressure cause, can cause something that is like even one weld loose to pop off. It caused irreparable damage to the bottom of his car, and it caused damage to his survival cell, his internal combustion engine, control electronics, and most importantly, his energy store. Because he was on his second energy store of the season when you're only allotted two, formula, or the FIA gave him a 10 place grid penalty, which was considered one of the worst grid penalties in F1 history. Uh, I mean, everyone was hoping to see a double podium for, from Ferrari after having such a bad season compared to the other seasons, but unfortunately the FIA did not let up on their decision about the 10 grid penalty, and he had to go all the way down to P12 at the beginning of the race. Yeah, and obviously after the penal penalty was handed out, Ferrari appealed. The FIA argued that they didn't have the power to waive the penalty because the incident was caused by external circumstances, but they actually do. So they have the power to waive his penalty by the force uh, manager clause, which allows them to intervene in cases of, quote, unpredictable, unpreventable, and external events, which was exactly what this was. Um, then we move on to Quali, where we had a really, really impressive performance by Ferrari, landing them in P1 and P2, but then because of the pen penalty got kicked down. Uh, the late start, <coughs> sorry, the late start was hard for even people attending the race, and other than qualifying just at the race itself, overall crowd, crowd control was lacking, and many got blocked from going on pedestrian bridges, getting back into the, like, inside of the track where all the hotels were. So, for example, like, my family had to walk three miles at 2 a.m. to get back to our hotel because we had to walk all the way around the track. So, the race itself was amazing. The, it had a great start. Max Verstappen did push off Charles Leclerc on that first turn, um, which he got a five-second uh, penalty, which was very well-deserved. Uh, drivers really had to be very careful about their cold tires and brakes, and the most common place for the loss of back tire control was the chicane on turn seven and eight. On lap three, the back of Lando Norris's car hit a bump, and he lost control of, and spun out and hit the barrier hard. He was immediately taken to the hospital for precautionary checks, and it broke my heart just a little bit <laughs> watching that. It was very, very hard yeah. to watch. It was not expected at all oh, no, from him. Absolutely not. Um, then later during the race on turn 14, there was an intense battle between Max Verstappen and George Russell, which led to a collision. Uh, originally, seeing it and the commentators thought that it was Max's fault, but then Russell was given the penalty. But after watching it back, you can kind of see where it, that came from. And then later after the race, Russell took uh, blame for the uh, crash itself. Overall, it was definitely probably one of the best races of the season. It had the most overtakes of any race this season. And then the final lap overtake by Charles Leclerc uh, against Checo Perez was very impressive and had to be definitely one of my favorite moments from this season. It was funny because coming into this race, there was a lot of speculation and a lot of backlash, but it turned out being, being actually really good for racing. It ultimately became one of my favorite races and also one of the favorite races among drivers. Looking toward next year, the logistics of the race will be much smoother. The only thing that F1 got really, really lucky about was the temperature, the outside temperature of the air. So during the race itself, the average temperatures were in the high 40s and low 50s, which is on the higher side for November in Vegas. But mind you, Vegas can reach temperatures of the high 20s or low 30s during November, which could be detrimental to overall driving at future races. So F1 might have to start thinking about some solutions for that. Yeah, definitely. Moving on to the next race, compared to Las Vegas, Abu Dhabi was not nearly as exciting. I mean, this track was first seen in the 2009 F1 season, and it has had very minor changes since then. Starting with qualifying, Verstappen took pole position in quali. This is something that's obviously expected of him in all, like looking at all of his wins this season, with Leclerc and Piastri in second and third. Now, one interesting thing about this is that this is the first time Oscar Piastri outqualified Norris in his rookie season. So obviously this was something that was not expected from Lando Norris or from Oscar Piastri. Fans were really excited, but also after seeing how uh, Las Vegas played out for Lando Norris, fans wanted him to do better this race. Absolutely. Um, two interesting outcomes in qualifying. The first one is that Sainz was out after Q1 and he landed P16. That is something unexpected. While Ferrari has not been performing as well as we had been hoping, we had still expected better from them. And then another interesting thing is Yuki Tsunoda landed P6, which is his best ever starting position in all of his seasons. Moving on to the actual race, there was no particular, 
particularly interesting start to the race, but one thing to note is that both Kevin Magnussen and Daniel Ricciardo had to pit early in the race. Both had to do it before the 10 lap mark. Moving on to a little later in the race, one exciting thing was that Yuki Tsunoda led the race for five laps, telling the media after, mm -hmm. quote, yeah, I gave it everything. To be honest, I didn't know I was leading the lap. This happened as everyone was pitting, and then he was leading the lap, um, the race for five consecutive laps up until he had to pit, and he had no clue what was happening. Obviously, his team was very excited for him. I was this very is excited. <laughs> probably like one of the best performances we have ever seen from him as well. One disappointing event, though, was for McLaren fans. McLaren had a very, very slow pit stop of 5.1 seconds, despite the fact that they hold the fastest two pit stops of the season and the fastest pit stop ever in Formula One of 1.8 seconds. This 5.1 seconds was very disappointing. As a McLaren fan, I can speak, and also especially looking at how they had performed in the last race and at the beginning of this race. Hamilton also ran into the back of an Alpine, causing some mild damage to the front wing of the Mercedes, but we didn't see any major damage or any like major changes happening in the race due to that. Another crash was, that, um, was when Perez crashed into Norris, causing him to go off of track. People have had disagreements about whose fault it was. Originally, everyone said it was Perez's fault, and then people said, no, it's Norris's fault because he was the one taking the outside on that turn. However, eventually, Perez is the one that got the five-second penalty for causing the collision. So regardless of what people thought, obviously, they blamed Perez. And then um, moving on to the end of the race, because of the battle for the Drivers' Championship, Leclerc allowed Perez to pass him the last lap to limit George Russell's points haul. So he allowed him to go from, I think, third to second place so that after he gets the five-second penalty, he would hopefully move down to third. However, after looking at the timing, um, Perez unfortunately moved down to fourth, causing George Russell to beat him in points, making Mercedes win Ferrari by just three points. Obviously, by the end of the race, Max Verstappen won something very expected, but this means that he made history in F1 with 19 wins in one season. Yeah, it was definitely an interesting race, th last race for the season, but things got a little bit more crazy when I thought it was supposed to be a very mellow winter season with an a week of this season ending. Um, so next season is going to be very interesting, but we're not going to really have a big look into it until uh, preseason testing it's, that starts in March. The grid has been locked in and confirmed. There's no changes at all. So we're not really sure what's going to happen with drivers until then. Something that is interesting is McLaren has struck a deal with Mercedes to use its power units until, 20, until 2030, and Road Bull is expected to perform. And, uh, but Mercedes is also expected to make some changes. Thank you for joining us this season, and we'll see you later in the spring. Thanks, Sarah and Tia. Next, our analysts tell us all you need to know about the NHL season. Thanks, Sajel and Ashley. I'm Ryan Jangel, joined today by Sarah Gores. We've got a lot of NHL action to break down for you. So, Sarah, what's been interesting to you so far this year? Yeah, what's really been interesting is just the division leaders overall. So leading the Metropolitan Division is the New York Rangers, going 18-5-1, and, and their strength this season has really been keeping the puck out of their net. The 2021-22 Vezina winner uh, Igor Shesterkin has and the revived Jonathan Quick have a combined for goals 60 against and a 915 save percentage with a 2.53 goals against average. They also really have a strong defense core, even with Adam Fox's injury. And this includes Captain Jacob, Jacob Truba, who's second in the league for block shots with 81. Leading the Atlantic Division this year, as they did last year, are the Boston Bruins with a 17-5-3 record on the year. Their strength, as it was for the majority of last season, is in their net and on the penalty kill. The tandem that everyone loves of Jeremy Swayman and the reigning Vesna winner, Linus Olmark, have combined for a 9-2-5 save percentage and a 2-3-9 goals against average. And that sits them second in the league in terms of goals allowed on the year with 62 against. As for the penalty kill, the Bruins are firing at an 89% on the kill this year, allowing 10 power play goals against through their 25 games, which, you know, it really helps when your team has taken 113 penalties on the year. But one thing that I want to highlight on particular with their penalty kill is how their centers have stepped up defensively when replacing longtime captain, well, not longtime captain, but longtime star Patrice Bergeron, the likes of Pavel Zaka, Charlie Coyle, and Johnny Beecher, average a combined over seven minutes time on ice shorthanded on the year so far. It was definitely really impressive. And then we jump to the Pacific Division where my Golden Knights are leading with a record of 17-5-5. Five and five. 
Their strength really has just been keeping a balance with their play. They're top 5% in both goals for and goals against, with 87% per on the penalty kill and 22% on the power play. And star Jack Eichel has is been a point per, uh, point per game player this season, which we made a note of in our preview segment. Aiden Hill is also having a phenomenal season with 10-2-2 and, two and, two and a 9-3-5 save percentage and 1.87 goals against average. And leading the Central Division this year are the Colorado Avalanche with a 16-8-2 record. Their main strength has been their ability to put the puck in the net. They're third in the league in goals for and feature three players with 30 points already on the year, the likes of defenseman Kale McCarr, star forward Nathan McKinnon, and one of the most underrated players in the sport of hockey in Miko Rantanen, mm -hmm. and another with 20 points of his own in Valerie Nachushkin. And that comes on the back of some key injuries to Captain Gabriel Landeskog, which we mentioned in our preview, as well as Arturi Lekkinen, and with defenseman Samuel Girard taking a leave of absence for the NHL PA assistance program. The second thing we want to talk about this year is one of the most hyped up players that we've seen in a little while, and that is Connor Bedard. The Blackhawks star forward is living up to the hype. The 2023 first overall pick has 11 goals and 10 assists in his 15, er, 25 games on the season, and he's doing this at 18 years old. Very impressive. He's leading both his team in points and all rookies on the year, making him about the Calder favorite right now for Rookie of the Year. And what's shocking for that is most of his production is coming at five-on-five five play. The Blackhawks' power play has not been as well as you know some might have thought this year. That's due to an injury to Taylor Hall and Corey Perry being you know waived and no longer on the team anymore. Yeah, no, that's definitely really impressive. On a less happy note, we see Edmonton really, really struggling, going 10, 12, and 1. They're near the bottom of the NHL standings and have already fired their head coach. Slow starts for Karnak McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl, and, and Jack Campbell's woes have continued and sent down to AHL Bakersfield. Yeah, it's not looked great for Jack Campbell and Stuart Skinner in net for the Oilers. Campbell didn't have a great start down at Bakersfield either. People think he might be up soon again with the big club, but that $5 million contract, not looking so great. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a look at three teams that we think are trending up this year and highlight one player from each of them. First, I'm going to start with the Vancouver Canucks. Like, I did not see this coming from this team, especially from Brock Besser, who's always had a knack for scoring goals, especially at North Dakota. He could put the puck in the net, but I would not have thought he'd be leading the league in goals at this point with 18. Yeah, and then sending it to Detroit, Alex uh, Dieberkick uh, has – is a point-per-game player in his first season at Detro in Detroit, which is quite impressive. Mm -hmm. And then out in L.A., the goaltending tandem of Cam Talbot and Phoenix Copley somehow is keeping this team afloat. They actually just won their, I believe, 11th straight road game to start the year, and that's on the back of Talbot especially. A 1.84 goals against average and a 9.33 save percentage, which is... Yeah, really impressive for a guy in his yeah. mid 30s. Absolutely. And coming off, uh, you know, some years where he's bounced around mm -hmm. teams on a little flyer here with the Kings, and he's really stabilized what was perceived as a shaky goaltending team. Yeah, absolutely. And now here are some teams that, you know, on the flip side, we find trending down, and we think you'll notice a trend here. We'll start up in the nation's capital in Canada with the Ottawa Senators, where both their goalies feature a sub 900 save percentage. And weirdly, with how the NHL schedule is working, they haven't played as many games as these other teams. They went to Sweden, but when they've come back, you know, they just really have not played as many as some of these other teams. I believe they're only at 19 or 20 games played on the year. Yeah, absolutely. And then going to the New Jersey Devils, their goalies have the second highest goals allowed per game with negative 14 goals below expected. They're just really not performing at the level that we were expecting to them to this season, so it's kind of sad to see. Mm -hmm. And then the final team that we have not been impressed with this year are the Minnesota Wild, who have also already fired their head coach on the year. You know, as, as basic as it sounds, they haven't been able to score and they haven't been able to defend. They have a negative 14.8 goal save below expected on the year and a negative 14.3 goal differential below expected uh, on the season as well for a team that, you know, features some really good talents. And, and you know, Philip Gustafson and Marc-Andre Fleury Flurry's getting up there in age, but Gustafson had a really good year last year, and they just have not been able to perform as they did last year. Yeah. That'll do it from us today and for the semester. We appreciate you joining on behalf of Sarah and myself. We'll see you in the spring.
Thanks, Ryan and Sarah. Stick around for Sagel's interview with Garrett Johnson. But first, Rami and Issa have Unstoppable's top 10. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our final top 10 plays of the semester. We hope you enjoyed watching with us this fall, and best of luck on your finals. Let's jump in one last time with number 10 as we see the Indiana Pacers and specifically Tyrese Halliburton pull up deep from three, count it, and one. What a play to set him to the free throw line. The Pacers have been playing exceptionally well in the in-season tournament, and I think they even are going to take down the Lakers in the final tonight. I hope so. Coming in at number nine, it's Red Wings' JT Comfort with an impressive first goal against the Bruins. You can see some really impressive stick work and passing by the Red Wings during the power play uh, to get this shot. David Perrin comes in with the assist, letting Comfort tip, tip the puck in, scoring the first goal of the game. Uh, and the Red Wings were able to keep their lead winning, I think, 5-2. to two. Beautiful, beautiful play there. Coming in at number eight is the Denver Broncos. Russell Wilson fakes the handoff and launches it downfield to Cortland Sutton, who makes the grab. And to add insult to injury, it was a pass interference call on the Texans as well. Sutton has been balling out this season, absolutely coming in clutch lately for Russell Wilson. At number seven, we have Cole Palmer from Chelsea with a gorgeous penalty kick. He places the ball beautifully in the top left corner, uh, and the youngster shot tied their game against Manchester City, City showing his talent. Uh, I think Palmer is actually going to go pretty far, but we'll see. Coming in at number six, bang, bang, Niner gang. Debo Samuel takes this one all the way to the house. They absolutely dominated the Philadelphia Eagles on their home turf. What a master class from Debo, putting up three touchdowns, and they whooped Philly 42 to 19. I think I've got the Niners as my Super Bowl pick from the NFC. Mm. At number five, we have the Packers quarterback Jordan Love with an absolutely stunning pass to Romeo Dobbs. I mean, the distance of the throw is, is impressive on its own, not to mention the catch. Um, a fantastic play by the Packers. Coming in at number four is my very own Seattle Seahawks. Geno Smith launches this one over the middle to DK Metcalf, who takes it to the house and records the fastest speed in the season of 22.3 miles per hour. And if you look at his celebration, that says, standing on business in sign language. Look at him go. Uh, coming in at number three, uh, the Flyers went against the Penguins last week. Here we can see Scott Lawton get around Malkin, impressively putting the puck away. A beautiful shorthanded goal by Lawton uh, and a really exciting moment in the game. You can watch again here in the replay. Just a nice, beautiful little tick right into the goal. I love it. It was so fun for me to watch. Um, and honestly, I'm a little bit of a Flyers girly. So. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say that too many times out here. <laughs> Coming in at number two is Tampa Bay. Specifically, Baker Mayfield finds his top target of the season. Mike Evans over the middle, who takes this one all the way to the house. Evans has reached 1,000 yards every year of his career. I think he needs to be in the Hall of Fame immediately. And look at that dive over the pylon to put Tampa Bay ahead of Carolina. They would end up going on to win this game. I think they have a legitimate shot at the playoffs next year if they keep rebuilding with Mike Evans. He's really, really good. <laughs> Coming in at number one, finally, is an impressive game by the Celtics. Uh, in this clip, Peyton Pritchard and Nemia Keta with a beautiful alley-oop. Pritchard sets it up nicely for Keta's dunk, uh, and the Celtics went on to win on their home court, 125 to 119. Thanks, folks. We enjoyed we hope you enjoyed the top 10 plays of this semester, and we'll see you in the spring. See you guys then. Wow, there were some amazing moments in there. Don't worry, Unstoppable's top 10 will be back next semester. And finally, on this morning's show, I sat down with basketball player Garrett Johnson to talk to him about the challenges he's faced in order to get back on the court. Take a look. Joining me now on Unstoppable is GW redshirt freshman Garrett Johnson. Garrett, thanks so much for speaking with me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so about a month ago, you played your first game in two and a half years after undergoing nine rounds of chemotherapy, four surgeries, um, and you've done a phenomenal job, 21 points in the first game. And so um, with two Rookies of the Week since, obviously you've had such a great start to your GW career and um, such an inspiring journey as well. And a lot of local and national media outlets have picked up on that. What has the increased media attention been like for you in the last couple of weeks? Uh, it's been a lot for sure. Um, it's been really cool to see, you know, the people that care about um, what I've been through and, and what I'm doing now. But, you know, I think it's definitely got to keep it all in perspective. Um, 
you know, we have a lot of things to focus on as a team and, you know, the media attention comes can draw away from that. So I think the coolest part has just been seeing people that are going through something similar to what I went through and them reaching out to me, um, talking about their experiences and how I've possibly inspired them a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, has your story becoming public impacted your game on the court at all or um, kind of like your chemistry with the team? No, I don't think so. I mean, for me, the what's always kept me uh, kind of centered is, is playing basketball and being on the court. It's kind of where I get away from, you know, all the noise or whatever's going on in my life. So um, I think as soon as I step on the floor with, with my teammates, um, all the noise kind of drowns out and just, just basketball at that point. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about your career at GW so far, but kind of going back to high school, some of the highlights from your career, three-star prospect, uh, scored over 1,000 points, district player of the year, first team all-regional. Um, so take me back a little bit to your perspective when you were first looking at schools and making that decision um, of, you know, obviously being recruited by so many different universities, but ultimately choosing Princeton. What were you looking for in a basketball program back then? Yeah, for me, um, it was definitely uh, trying to get a, a best of both worlds situation, trying to go somewhere where I get a great education, a great degree, um, and also uh, be able to get better as a basketball player and fulfill my dream of going to the NBA. Um, so, so that was definitely what wins that thing. I had a great relationship with the coaching staff throughout my whole high school career. So, so for me, it just kind of felt like uh, the right place. Mm -hmm. And have you been redefining success and achievement on the court uh, as you've kind of gone through this journey these last couple of years? It's kind of uh, a two-side thing because, for one, I definitely am just happy uh, to be out there and grateful to be playing basketball and healthy again. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I still have the same goals and, and drives and motivations to to play professional basketball at the highest level and uh, and do great things in college. So, so you know, I think I can have both at once, um, being grateful for being out there, but also still pushing myself to, to achieve those goals. What role did basketball play mentally or physically in your recovery? And how were you kind of thinking about it, thinking about getting back on the court? Yeah, I mean, it was everything to me uh, that kept me uh, kind of hopeful about, you know, getting through what I was going through. Um, so I, I just spent a lot of time in the gym to kind of keep myself above water a little bit. So, so yeah, so for me, the, the whole time was about getting back on the floor. Um, and, and I never really tried to doubt it too much. There was definitely times that it seemed kind of improbable. But, but uh, yeah, I would just go back to the gym and, and keep working and, and hope that one day I'd, I'd get back healthy. Mm -hmm. And I know a big part of you choosing GW is being closer to your family, being from Virginia. Um, were there specific moments or actions from your family that stand out as particularly influential in helping you to recover and getting back on the court? Um, I don't know if there's one moment, but I think just times where I was really down and felt like, you know, the situation was kind of, you know, overcoming me and, and overwhelming, uh, them being just in my corner and, and listening to me. I think that was the biggest thing, people in, in my shoes, uh, having someone that, that just listens to you. Um, because uh, there's not many things people can say to change your situation when you're going through stuff like that. So, so yeah, they were definitely just in my corner, and uh, you know, I wouldn't be a baby here without them for sure. And then looking, you know, at your first couple games at GW, can you walk me through some of the emotions that you felt stepping back on the court for the first time? Do you see your family in the stands when um, you played your first game? Yeah, um, it was an amazing. It's been an amazing feeling. You know, every game I kind of take a moment during the national anthem and during the starting lineups to just kind of look around and, and be, be thankful for, for where I'm at compared to where I was last year, the year before that. And, and it makes it even more amazing to see my, my family in the, in the crowd every game and see them after uh, the game and, and talk to them. So uh, yeah, it's been really special for sure. And how has your relationship with Coach Caputo and the team grown over the past couple of weeks? Yeah, um, I think we're getting more and more uh, team chemistry as, as the year goes on. Uh, you kind of in games, as you get different tests and, and face different challenges, you, you grow together. You can either grow apart or grow together. I think we're growing together and moving in the right direction. And, uh, you know, that's thanks to the coaching staff and Coach Caputo. Um, you know, they give us the right scouts and, and they make sure we're, our heads are in the right places. Um, and, and how is your perspective on, you know, stepping back a little bit, life and basketball changed over the past two and a half years? Yeah, I think for me, it's just about not looking too far in the future, um, just being happy kind of where your feet are and uh, not taking any moment for granted because, you know, at you know, the age we're at, you don't necessarily think that uh, you go through some of the things that, that I had to go through and you never really think it's you until it is. So, so I think it's just about appreciating where you are and your health and everything. Mm -hmm. and, and for other 
um, athletes, particularly young athletes who might be facing health challenges and setbacks, like what advice would you pass along to them? Yeah, I would say um, it's okay to, to feel like, you know, you're going through something really hard and because you, you are, but um, I think you have to keep some type of hope and, and motivation for life after whatever you're going through and try to find happiness in, in little things that you can throughout the time you're going through something, even though it is really hard. Um, and lastly, just uh, leaning on people around you. Um, it's not easy to go through something like that alone, so you definitely need, uh, it takes a village to get, to get through it for sure, so don't be uh, reluctant to rely on your family and close, uh, close ones around you. Who's really stood out to you in your support system? Um, I think besides my family, uh, my girlfriend was amazing the whole time. Uh, She'd come with me to, to my chemo sessions and sit with me uh, and just listen to all the you know crazy thoughts in my head during those times. So, see, so yeah, I, I can't thank her enough for, for being my corner during those times, for sure. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and sitting down with us today. Um, the last question I have for you is just, I guess, looking forward to the rest of your career, um, you know, last couple of years at GW, what are your goals and, and for potentially after graduating? Yeah, I think, uh, I definitely want to win a lot of basketball games here. Um, you know, I don't know when the last time they won the Atlantic 10 was, but I think that's a goal of ours. We have a lot of talented young players on our team, so you know, we know we can do some special things. And uh, you know, I, I want to be a professional basketball player. That's what I want to do my whole life. So I think as long as we focus on the right things as a team uh, and I keep getting better, that you know, those things will fall in line eventually. Well, thank you so much again for sitting and chatting and sharing your experience. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Such an inspiring story, and thanks again to Garrett for coming onto the show. That'll do it for Unstoppable this semester, and from all of us here at GWTV, race high.